Hi, I'm Andre Berry, bassist, songwriter, recording and sound engineer, slash aspiring producer in the Los Angeles area. Via Cleveland, Ohio. What's up, C-Town? All right. I come before you today to talk to you about something I'm super excited about. What a great time this is. What a great day this is. I'm here to talk to you about the Zoom, Zoom L12. L12. Okay? Uh, a power trio of a unit. I mean, you've heard of the trio of Doom. This is the trio of Zoom. Okay? Why do I call it the trio of Zoom? Because it's a multi-tracker, live mixer, and it's an audio interface all combined into one. What? 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 Before I go any further, let me say a special thanks to my man, Carlitos Del Puerto. Uh, if you don't know who Carlitos is, you need to know. He's one talentoso hermano. Ha uh ha. -huh. And special thanks to Samuel Green for taking my calls. You know, uh, Samuel Green is product development specialist at Zoom, and he loaned me this unit, sent it to me, whatever, however you, whatever they do, and allowed me to check it out. And I'm in love with it. If he ever asks for it back, I'm gonna be like, come on, man. So, okay, so I'm from back in the days of Cassette recorders. I learned how to overdub with two cassette players. And then I graduated to four track cassette, and then eight track cassette, and then 16 track reel. And then I got four Tascam D88s, big time. Those are the days of having a record deal and all that. You had a little bit of money to play with. But here's the thing. This thing sounds better than those. Oh, what? What? It sounds better than those units. So if I can get great recordings from those units back in those days when I was bouncing drums down to one track and then recording bass and guitar and bouncing those together and bouncing those three to one track so I could put a vocal on another track and then back. And I got decent recordings. What can I do today? Oh my goodness, the possibilities are large. It sounds like it was uh, based off of a Neve console. Warm, clear, oh, let's do it. So what we're gonna be covering in this video, if you hang with me and if you check this out, we're gonna cover three things. We're gonna look at the features of the L12 and the possibilities of what it gives you. Part two, we're gonna do a live recording session with a really cool band called the Jazz Junkies. They're a Riverside, San Bernardino County institution, been together a long time, and there's some great players. So we'll get a nice recording, and I'm going to show you the ins and outs of getting that all together. We're going to talk about what your job is as an engineer. Sounds. How do you get the kick drum to sound right? Does it sound wrong from the beginning, or does it sound great in the room? How come it's not sounding right? Is it the right mic? Is the mic placed in the right place? Do you need this? Do you need that? As a producer, it's your job to try to coax your musicians to get the thing that you need to make this recording awesome through love or through fear or whatever you got to do. That's the art of producing. And that's dealing on a human level. And then part three, we're going to mix the song. And we're going to look at what do you look at to make things fit together beautifully, right? We're talking about, you know, do you need compression? Frequency overlapping. Ah, uh, the instruments muddling each other up. How do you get clarity and definition of each lane, okay? All right, so we're gonna talk about those things. Let me lay a tidbit on you in closing, right? Here's wise words that uh, a man told me once and they just resonated with my soul, okay? Crap in, crap out. Beauty in, beauty out. What does that mean? That means if you got a bass player that's hacking at the bass and there's fret buzz and no sense of dynamics and he's just wants to play fast and he blah, blah, blah. 
and then you wanted to sound like Nathan East, I'm here to tell you it ain't gonna happen, okay? The beauty of Nathan East comes from Nathan East. That human being puts that down on tape and that's why it sounds the way it does, okay? And no amount of fixing and crushing and EQing and all that is gonna make crap sound like beauty. Here's another tip a wise man told me and it was just words of wisdom, spiritual insight. You can't polish a turd. Okay, you can't make a turd shine, which means if you got a piece of crap, no matter what you do, it's still a piece of crap. Now, let me let me say something to you. Samples, loops, picking up a loop and going, oh, that's bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm producing. Eh. You've done nothing. Live recording of live human beings. That's the art of recording to me. The other stuff, they do all the work for you. The sounds are already dialed up. All you're doing is assembling the pieces together. You're putting together a puzzle and calling yourself an artist. The real art is in dialing up human beings and what they bring to it, right? All right, so stick around. We're gonna get into it. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, I'm gonna give you a lot of tidbits along the way and I'm gonna help you to make your recording sound pro using the great tool of the Zoom L12. What a magnificent day this is. Ah. Hello, welcome to part one of this tutorial. Today we're talking about the Zoom L12. Kudos and thank you to Zoom for making another great, smart, forward-thinking product. What a great company. Okay, so right off the top, Combi Jacks, great. I had an electronic project that we used to record and I had to take all kind of DI boxes and cables and it was a pigsty. But now it's new school, right? To have Combi Jacks going all the way across, awesome. Now, 9, 10, and 11, 12 are quarter inch inputs for like digital keyboards or whatever. But you also have RCAs to hook up a phone or whatever. And right below that, if you hit the USB button, now your DAW audio return comes up on the faders. Smart design, right? And we have the master signal going XLR out to the front of the house. But we also have it here on quarter inch. And the great thing is we can hook a set of monitors up to that and have a separate volume control for our monitors that won't affect the front of the house. Now get this, we got not one, not two, not three, but five headphone mixes, five headphone mixes. That's awesome. No longer do I have to take these little dumb boxes with the wall warts and extension cords and TRS cables and my wife will come in and say, honey, you got spaghetti everywhere. <laughs> okay. When you think about the fact of having five headphone mixes and what I had to come up with to get it done, this is why it's astounding to me. Okay, so if I want to create a separate mix, I just go down to the fader mode button, right? And I can either choose the master or I can choose any one set of the headphones. And now the faders control the mix of that particular headphone. And if I go back up top, there's a button there. And if it's out, it just sends the master signal to the headphones. But if it's in, it sends whatever you have dialed up in the fader mode to the headphones. I mean, how luxuriously cool is that? But you know what, let's keep going. We're just scratching the surface here. Okay, gain knobs for each mic pre. Okay, that's a given, that's a good thing. But these gain knobs also become record level to your DAW station, okay? That's great. And then right below that, we have compression on each channel. Now. You may have a great signal and everything might be going great, but every now and then it peaks. You could just put a little compression on there and maybe drop that peak and keep your fat tone the way it is. Huh? That's the goal. Now, the select button, what that tells you is just to follow the blue metal road. And that takes you to the channel strip. Whatever you have selected becomes the focus of that channel strip. You have highs at 10K, lows at 100 Hertz, a sweepable mid with 15 dB of cut or boost, 
right? You can pan the signal where you want. You can send the signal to the effects bus and control the master volume of the effect right here. You can do a low cut in case your bass player's uh, bass is rumbling the lead singer's microphone. You can do a low cut and hopefully help that, right? Okay. Up top, you can do an EQ on off check. So if you feel like maybe I'm getting too far away from it and I'm jacking up the mix, you can just go back to what the original mix was and say, oh yeah, I'm really messing it up. Let me flatten this back out. Now on each channel, there's a record play button. If you light it red, you go into record. Then all you have to do is go over to the transport, hit the record button, hit the play button to start the motion, and you're recording. How easy is that? Now I know touch screens are all the rage and they can do a lot of information inside the touch screen. But I'm telling you, when you gotta go menu, activate menu, and then I gotta go to record page, and then I gotta go over here to set the level, it's just too much. I don't have time for all that. There are advantages to touch screen. If you're a house band and you're gonna be in a room for six weeks and you do a sound check in the beginning and you get it all straight and you put the mixer in a box and you put a lock on it so nobody can touch it, yeah. Uh, you know that works but when you're in the heat of the moment and something's feeding back and you have to go through menus to get to where you need to go and the feedback is happening no no see for me that's making the whole experience frustrating i have a saying buttons faders and knobs let me do my job okay so you got a feedback and it's happening right now bam it's gone bam it's gone you do a nice Michael Jackson twirl at your board, uh, grab that fader, yeah, all is good. And on the other hand, you can just hit the mute button. It's right in front of you. Easy access. Buttons, faders, and knobs. Let me do my job. But wait, there's more. Okay, let's go over to the transport area, right? Now, up top, we have a menu button. You enter it by pushing menu, and easily you can create a new project. You can select a different project, you can delete it, you can name it. Uh, you go and go around to the back and plug in a USB stick and you can export to that stick. You can import files from that stick or you can import a whole project. Now next up is folders and that's just for file organization. You pick the folder you want your files to go to. And then under record and play, you can pick your uh, bit rate and a couple other things. But the interesting thing for me is the metronome. Okay, while you got time signatures, you got different sounds, the interesting thing is you can set the level for each individual's headphone mix. But let me give you a heads up because it threw me at first. So you go to metronome, you go to level, and you set the level using the rotary knob. But then you have to push enter the knob in order to set the level and for it to stay. I was doing a session and I would hit menu and not push that button and the headphone cowbell that would jump up and the sax player was like, man, it's loud again. And I, I quickly learned that you have to push enter. Okay, but if your band plays to this metronome, the great thing is you can line it up with your DAW fairly easily. You import the files and you can see the waveforms and the click. And if you enter the same BPM, it lines up and it's great. Now you can cut and paste and add bells and whistles and do all the things you want to do. It's an awesome time, you all. If you knew where I came from and to see this day happening, you'd appreciate it like I do. I hope you do. So let me just make a little comment about what Zoom is doing. The thing that I think separates them from the rest of the pack is that they're thinking about all the tools a musician would need to get it done, but they're also thinking about how to complement the computer world because that's where it's all headed, right? It has to go through the computer and out to the world. So why not connect me to the computer immediately? Why do I have to do all this work and can't get in touch with my computer? And then when I want to export it, I have this two-track mix that's frozen. Ah, I want to change it a little bit. I have to go back to the standalone unit and back and forth. Just have me hooked up to the computer to the world and be able to get it out to the world first hand foremost connected. And that's where I think that they're ahead of the pack. These standalone pieces that have no functionality with the computer, to me, they're just archaic is the word. But Zoom is saying to me, first and foremost, 
we're going to hook you to a computer and you can get to work. You're at the front of the computer. You're the now the front end of the computer. You can do more, but you can also take it with you. Take it to rehearsal and then bring that back home. And you can mix it in on the fly in the unit if you want. And can I just say, the multifunctionality is amazing. For example, Zoom L12 is a great backup system for you when you're recording on your computer. You can record to both at the same time. And if your computer freezes up, you got your dependable Zoom L12 still there. All is well with the world. Well, it's not, but you get my point. All is well with your sound world. See, Zoom is addressing something that I felt. See, when I went to school for recording engineering, I learned on 24 track and a Neve board. And you got the sound great on the Neve board first. But when audio interfaces came in, you had to go into them raw and get the raw signal of the drums down on tape without processing. And now you're stuck with all these transients that you don't like, and you have to figure out how to get them out of there and make them sound great. It was just a backwards way of working to me. But now this Zoom board sounds great. And so what I'm putting into my computer sounds great. And when I hear it back, it already sounds great. But OK, enough commentary. Let's talk about these faders here. OK, so now there's a thing called scene. And you can save or recall a scene of a mix that you have. And it's great because it's very simple. All you do is hit save, hit the number that you want to save it to, and whatever mix settings you have will be saved to that number. And what you'll see is a little LED. Let me see if I can recall. Do I have, did I save them? I think I saved, there it is. Yeah, I saved a, a, a setting from the other day. Okay, so now... Now, what you have to do is you have to go up to the LED that's there, go come back down, and now the fader is activated. You're not going to hear anything at first, and that's a safety measure because if you popped in a new preset and it was all wacky and crazy, you might have somebody on a microphone that's because you put in a new preset. So it's a safety measure. What you want to do is get used to that throw, throw up and throw down, okay? Throw it up. Pull it down, and now the fader is working, and now you can adjust the mix to whatever you want it to be. And put it where the LED was, and it'll be that preset, okay? And see, that's another great thing. Zoom is thinking about us, man. They're thinking about what we need and fulfilling that need. Okay, so now you put the faders up to where the LEDs are because you pulled it down and you put it right back, and now that mix is in place, right? That's the beauty of scenes, saving, and recalling. It's another awesome feature. Is this thing packed, loaded with good stuff, or what? I mean, okay, we're looking at the rear panel now. First up, we have a control input. And I have a little box here that I use for record, punch in, punch out. You can also use it for effects on, off, or transport, stop, start. Next up, we have an SD card slot, and depending on what SD cards you get, you can get up to 90 hours of 12-track recording. Isn't that awesome? Next up, a switch to choose your sampling frequency, 44, 48, or 96. Just be aware that if you go to 96, there are limitations involved. Next up is class compliant mode for interfacing with an iPad iOS operating system. Next up is the USB jack for interfacing with a DAW on your computer. And right next to that is our switch to choose between audio interface, card reader mode, or USB host. And if you do select USB host, be aware the USB stick that you stick in the slot next to it needs to be 2.0 or higher. I tried 1.0 and got nothing. So just be aware of that. And in conclusion, we have our DC jack and our power switch. All this functionality encased in a clean-looking, classy, portable unit you can take anywhere. I mean, the Stevie Wonders, Elton Johns, James Browns, David Bowies, their recording process was Neanderthal compared to this. And they did great work. It's all right in front of us. It's in our hands. The tool is just a wonderful tool. And you can do so much with it here and there and everywhere. So I hope you take advantage of it. Stick with me. Part two coming up. Recording a live band.
Okay, how you doing? So before we uh, dive into the mix part of this, I first want to talk to you about the gear that I used, okay? Very simple. And the whole point of this video is to show you that you can do professional sounding things by MacGyvering what you got, right? You don't have to go out and buy a new Neumann mic or top of the line AKGs before you can sound good. Um, I think there's lessons to be learned when you have mediocre or poor equipment and you make it sound great. You learn a lot of things along the way about tricks, about how to make stuff work when you, ha when you don't have top of the line stuff. Um, some people want to go out and get the top of the line right away and they got to get the best this and better. And then you don't learn anything along the way. Um, it's like playing on a, a great amp for a guitar player immediately. When you play on crappy amps for years and you get those to sound great, when you finally get on a good amp, it's like you make it sound really great. You know, players like Jeff Beckett, they get on anything and sound great because they've worked with so many different things and they learn the ropes along the way. So I encourage you, run out, get yourself a Zoom L12, get yourself a few mics that you can afford and get to work right okay so on the kick i used the d112 okay we got that um i've had this mic for about 30 years right and i take care of it it's been around the block but uh it still works great um on the snare i just use this basic audio technical snare tom mic and it sounds great it's clear it's got crack to it okay now but get this this is something that i wanted to share with you all I have Audio-Technica 4051 pencil overhead mics. I have them. They're great, right? But I wanted to show what you could do with uh, minimal gear. And so on overheads, I use this stereo mic pointing down like this. And this mic costs 30 bucks. And uh, it's a Sony made for mini disc recorders. I have two of them. And, but it sounds great. You know, and these are the things you try to find along the way. You try to find thing, ways to uh, work things, and you learn, okay? On the saxophone, I have an Audio-Technica 4047. I have different mic, but I use this MXL 2008. I think it costs 50 bucks, you know, just to show what you could do. On percussion, I use these two MXL mics, and I think they were $69 a piece, right? And, uh, and for bass, uh, of course, I use something really good here. I have the Zoom B6, but I didn't even come out of the XLR jack. I just came out of the quarter inch jack and went into the high Z input because I wanted to plug a guitar cable in and, and I love the sound I get to my amp. So I just said, I'll just do it that way. And, uh, and I think the bass sounds great. Okay, so that's just a prep. Here, here's an idea. If you have one of these Zoom H2s, right? I've recorded using the monitor out and using a wide stereo pattern and going into a mixer and it has great mics in it, right? So my point is, is that a lot of times you have everything you need in order to get the job done, but we wait until we have top of the line this and i need this and i need an avalon this and i need this and i need this and then years go by and you don't do it you're not doing any great work you could be doing great work with simple tools and if you invest in an affordable tool like an l12 you can do so much because it sounds great on its own it sounds great anything you plug into it is going to sound decent so okay all right let's dive into mixing Okay, we're diving into our mix, okay? This is the song we did with the Jazz Junkies. Okay, so what we're going to do, I set up a marker to where the music is kind of playing fairly full, okay? And the first track is bass. So let's pull that up. Ooh, nice lows. That sounds pretty good to me. Let's see, bring up the kick. Mm 
Yeah. Now I'm listening to that kick and it sounds fairly boofy. Okay. There's something that I want to share with you all. There's a bass that you want to go doom, doom. You want to have a D on the front, doom. And there's a kick that you want to have boof, boof, boof. Now, the marriage between those two is tricky because on certain songs you have to give and take. You want the bass to carry the low end and the kick to have attack, or you want the bass to be attacky and the kick be underneath with a nice boof to it. So, and that's the trade off, and you have to figure out each song what falls where and what sounds best. And you can try a fat bass, you can try a more attack bass, you can try a fat kick, you can try a more attack kick. And finding that balance between those two. But the thing is, you don't want to have both of them boom, fat, boomy, right? You want to, to balance it between the two. You don't want to have both of them have a hard edge. You know what I mean? So you want to find the balance. So right here, we have a fat kick and a fat bass, right? And and the thing I love about the Zoom is it sounds warm. That bass is just going in direct out of my Zoom B6 pedal board, right? And it's not even coming out of the XLR output. It's coming out of the quarter inch output and going into channel one and no nothing, no EQ, no nothing. And this is what it sounds like. Nice and even. I love Zoom products. Okay, but then this kick. Let's select that. And I'm going to go up to the EQ and I'm going to brighten it up. Yeah. So it has more attack. And I'm going to take a tiny bit of lows off. Now by itself you might go, well, why does he want to do that? Because when you marry it with the bass. Now the kick doesn't get lost. And the bass carries the weight of the lows. Okay? Now let's add the snare in, channel three. Nice sounding snare, huh? Has a Steve Jordan vibe to it. I brighten it up just a little bit. Too, too much. Woo! Now, if you know those two are grooving together nice, you got a good start. You want to build the foundation to your house first before you started putting on the shingles. And the shingles are the frequencies up top. You got to have a strong, solid foundation and everything else rests on top of that, okay? So let's bring in the overheads. The left, select it. We're gonna pan it to the left so it has a stereo image. And then we go to the next one and we're gonna pan it to the right so it has a stereo image. Yeah. Now we're gonna brighten that up a little bit so the symbols have shimmer. So they have some shimmer on top. Is that the end of the song? Oh, I guess it is. Let's go back. Okay. Nice. Now that's bleed and whatnot, but you don't care about that. That does not mess up your mix at all because you don't want it to sound like samples, clean and nothing. You want it to sound like people, human beings in a room. You want it to sound like when you go listen to at a bar and you go listen to a band. You hear everything. And the mics are on and it's all coming through everything and they still get a great sound. Okay, here's our sax. Yeah. Now I might just put a little bit of compression on him. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, see, it just pulled that hard scream back just a tiny bit. That might even be too much. But let's go to six. What does he need? He needs a little bit of wetness, right? So we go to our effect and we turn it up. And we go ahead and crank it up because we want to hear what it sounds like. You hear that? Now it's obviously too long, right? So we go over here and we can adjust the time and the tone. And see, you have to watch with reverb because the snare is coming through the other mics that people have on. Okay, so the top knob is darkening the effect. Here is real bright. Here it is darker, right? And the second knob is adjusting the decay or the length of the reverb. Now I just turned it down a little bit. You want to get the length appropriate for the song, right? So if it's an up-tempo song, you don't want the, a long reverb washing over the whole track. What you want is a short reverb that can be heard, but when the next beat comes in, it's dying out, right? Because you don't want them multiplying, right? So check this out. Let's work with this reverb a little bit and try to get the timing right. That's not bad. It's dying out before he plays. Oh, excuse me, I hit my microphone. It's dying out before he plays his next note. That's just a basic guideline. Let's turn it up. Still too much reverb, so I'll just bring the volume of the reverb back. Okay, let's. Let's mute him for a minute. We're gonna get the percussion tracks going. And once again, we're gonna do a hard left and right. Select that channel. You heard it go to the right. And we're gonna give him a little bit of wetness too. And we're gonna put the wetness on the right, okay? We're gonna wet the right side. Now, to my ear, what I heard just then was I need to take a little bit of lows off the kick drum. So I might do a low cut. Let's see what that does. Then put some of this low back in just a little bit. But it's getting rid of the low air underneath so the bass can be clear. Yeah. I turned up the high end on the kick just a tiny bit. Okay, and I'm gonna put a little bit of verb on the snare. Yeah, hear it? Bring the sax back in. Now, did you check out how 
when I brought the sax back in, the reverb was more pronounced because the snare is bleeding through his mic too. So it adds in when you're limited with effects. Okay, so you, it's a, a balancing act. So you got to balance it on the saxophone so it doesn't overwhelm the snare and balance it on the snare so it doesn't, and just, it's a balancing act. And it's, uh, mixing is all about balance. Balance of frequencies, balance of sound, balance of tonalities, you just want it to have the entire spectrum. Okay, so we got our percussion in. Let's bring our keyboards in, okay? And then he has a pad. Yeah, you want it to just melt around that saxophone. Tiny bit more compression on the sax, so it doesn't jump out on the edges. snare crack a little bit more. I'm just going to put a tiny bit more high end. Yeah. I brought the overheads down just a touch. Bring the keys down just a touch. Bring up the bass just a hair so it's a little bit fatter. A little more funk to it. I think that sounds pretty good. Now here's the thing, when you're doing your master two track mix, you gotta ride things like in the old days. And you don't have uh, automation, right? So I would ride the bass up a little bit. Cause it's a lead. Keyboards, I'm gonna split them off just a tiny bit. One to the right, one to the left. So they're not on top of each other. Percussion. Uh. We gotta brighten the percussion a little bit. Let's go back. But you hear it coming into focus, you're coming into clarity. So the whole point is to have everybody have their own frequency lane, their own effects lane, their own space in the, in the picture. And if you can balance those so that it's punching and it's clear and it's warm at the same time, you're doing really, really good. So now we got a nice bottom on the bass. We got a punch on the kick drum. We got a crack on the snare. We got a brilliance on the cymbals. We got an edge on the horn, but it sits in the bed of the track between the keyboards, which we had didn't have to mess with too much because they have those sounds designed. Sometimes you might have to roll off low end or brighten it up a little bit, but those digital sounds are what they are. Now the percussion is an extra instrument. It's ear candy. So you want to have that candy heard, but it can't take over the mix. It's got to be back just a little bit. And you want them to have headphones on and listen for it 
as opposed to it hitting them over the head, unless it's a solo. So like I said, with this, you have to ride things to your two track master. So you got to do it the old fashioned way. You got to practice your mix, right? And practice your fader moves. I used to love that. Right. I really, really loved that when we used to sit at the board and it'd be like four of us, you know, and everybody would have their moves and we practice it. And then we'd be like, OK, you ready to print? We got it. Let's run through that one section one more time. And we'd all do our moves and, and we'd be laughing because so and so would mess up his moves. But it's that, that kind of thing. Right. So when you're doing your two track mix, you want to ride these faders and make a beautiful canvas of a two-track mix with your artistry of how you're blending things you bring you know when to bring the saxophone down because it's a little bit too much and you know when to increase the percussion and you know when the bass is being featured and you're riding these faders and creating a beautiful canvas and you can do the same thing with the effects fader you can do the mute buttons and the panning like this so let's go back to the top and let's check out what we got Turn it up a little bit. I'm shorten that reverb just a little bit. But on this section, I actually want it to be more, longer. There you go. So I'll, I'm going to ride that on my two track mix. Now I tighten it up. Giving the bass a feature a little boost. Now I'll bring it back. Yeah, sit him in the pocket. I want to hear a little bit more tap on the kick. Yeah. yeah. Let's pay attention to where his symbols hit. The percussion. Yeah, let's brighten him up just a little bit. Woo, symbols are nice. And you can hear the tom with a $30 mic. You can get it done. Just say to yourself, I have everything I need and I'm gonna get it done somehow. And you can do great things with very little. Brought the keyboard up a little bit. Sax feature. Artie, yeah. And there's Mark. Nice. Bass solo. If I wanted to, I could. I tried to put in an effect, but I didn't turn it fast enough. Chris on percussion. Drum. Henry. Woo! Ride the percussion. <laughs> Keyboard player did the crowd noise. Ah. Bring the sax up. I want to hear the sax a little bit wetter.
I love the way the reverb dies. So nice. Okay, so that's the overall process of building a mix and the concept. Okay, you all, thanks for joining me. I hope this video tutorial helps some of you. Um, those of you that already know all this information, please don't leave any negative comments. You know, it's like, uh, like my mother used to say, if you don't like what's on TV, change the channel. You know what I mean? So, uh, but this is geared to those who are diving into recording their band or their group or their, their whatever they're doing and they're um, wondering what they can do and what they can get done. Hopefully you have a better idea of the possibilities. Uh, the unit is the Zoom L12. It's a great, great tool. Uh, it's a wonderful unit, it sounds great. And uh, I hope you uh, get one for uh, your birthday or for Christmas or whenever and uh, get to work recording your friends and recording your band and becoming the producer of the future. All right. All right. Peace and blessings and special thanks to Carlitos Del Puerto and Samuel Green. Really appreciate you all. And uh, maybe we'll see you again sometime. Thank mm -hmm. you.